I'm just going to go through sort of three or four main areas within the uh, field of air fibrillation that are actually quite topical and relevant at the moment. First of all, just to go through the, the current indications, um, up until earlier this year, the only indication for performing catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation was in patients with symptomatic atrial fibrillation, be it paroxysmal or persistent, that could not be controlled with drug therapy, be that rate control or proper antiarrhythmic drug therapy. But they had to have symptoms. And that was the only indication that we had. Earlier this year, the European Society of Cardiology made an amendment to their 2010 guidelines for atrial fibrillation management. And what the guidelines now say that if you have patients who have highly symptomatic paroxysmal AF in a structurally normal heart with no other comorbidities, you can actually consider catheter ablation as a first-line treatment. So this is quite a, a significant change because in years gone by, even if you had a 35-year-old with a structurally normal heart who's getting paroxysmal AF and no other medical history, we would still give them a period of at least six to 12 months with probably a combination of verapamil and flecainide. And invariably, within 18 months of them starting that, they will get recurrent atrial fibrillation. It always happens. And then we would do the air fibrillation for them. This guideline now is actually opening the door for us to actually offer these patients uh, an air fibrillation procedure at the outset. The second major area, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is the role of anticoagulant drugs. Now, up until certainly two and a half years ago, uh, all major centres, certainly in the UK, were performing an air fibrillation procedure by pre-treating patients with warfarin for at least four to six weeks. About five days before the ablation, you would stop the warfarin. You would convert them to low molecular weight heparin injections. They would then come in, have the air fibrillation, and during the procedure, we heparinized them with unfractionated heparin. After the procedure, once all the tubes had been removed from the leg, they would get clexane injections again and restart their warfarin. And they would carry on that combination until the warfarin became therapeutic, which was anywhere from a few days to a few weeks after the actual ablation. And one of the things that the hematologists always tell us is that in a lot of these patients who have actually undergone an air ablation, um, controlling the INR in the immediate aftermath of the procedure has been very difficult. Even for patients who are previously extremely well controlled, the INRs are very labile. Um, and I'm sure part of that's just the actual, you know, the experience and the trauma of actually undergoing an air fibrillation procedure. And the clexane injections, patients don't like to take them, the low molecular weight heparin injections, a lot of bruising, hematomas, there's a lot of morbidity associated with it. And so about three or four years ago, there's some studies that came out of the United States whereby atrial fibrillation ablation was actually being performed on uninterrupted warfarin. So the warfarin is therapeutic for about four to six weeks before they continue it throughout the procedure. We heparinize them during the procedure, but we then don't have to use any of the low molecular weight heparin injections. And this, in fact, at St. Bartholomew's and at the London Independent is our standard practice now. The patients love it. They don't have to jab themselves with low molecular weight heparin injections. Um, it's cheaper because you don't have the cost of the low molecular weight heparin injections. And the INR control is much, much better. You don't have this fluctuation in the INR that we had previously. We've recently completed a study on this uh, and published it earlier um, last year, in fact. And this has shown that the bleeding complications are actually no higher if you do the procedure on uninterrupted warfarin. But most importantly, it would seem from all the major studies that have been done, the risk of thromboembolic complications, notably stroke, which is about 2%, is significantly reduced if you perform the pr procedure on uninterrupted warfarin. So I think that's a major, major shift in the way we're doing these procedures. There are still centers that stop the warfarin and do it with low molecular weight heparin injection bridging, but most centers now are actually moving to this, this protocol. And I think this is definitely the way forward. At our centre, in fact, and certainly my own practice, is just about any procedure that we do, including device implantation, I do all of them on uninterrupted warfarin. Okay? So if someone's got atrial fibrillation, they need a biventricular ICD or a pacemaker putting in, as long as the INR is under 3.5, 3 it's quite safe to actually do the implant and you don't have an excess of bleeding complications. So I actually think it makes the whole thing a lot more cheaper and above all, it's much nicer for the patients and it is safer. Of course, there are newer anticoagulants. You know, dibigatran is, is currently available. I mean, my own, my own view on dibigatran is that I don't think I've 
converted a single patient from warfarin 2 to bigotran, and I have one patient who is genuinely intolerant of warfarin who is currently taking the bigotran. Everybody else, you know, has remained on warfarin. There are protocols in place for performing invasive procedures like this on the bigotran. The problem is there is no real antidote for the bigotran available at the moment. And if you do have a, a bleeding complication during the procedure, which for an air fibrillation occurs in about 1% one, one to 2% of patients, you, you can get cardiac tamponade, then of course if they were taken to Bigotran, it would be a lot more difficult for you to manage the bleeding complication. Warfarin is very easy. We have an antidote for warfarin. Um, we use one called Octoplex, which is the prothrombin complex concentrate, and it reverses the effect of the warfarin within half an hour. So at the moment, you know, we're not really doing any procedures on uh, drugs like the Bigotran. I think the next slot of newer anticoagulants that come out, notably rivaroxaban, the ant antidote for warfarin seems to work for rivaroxaban, in which case, you know, doing the procedures on those anticoagulants would be a lot safer and manageable. The next sort of area is novel ablation technologies. There are a couple of big things that have really happened in the last five years. First of all, we, the ablation catheters, which are the long wires that we pass up from the leg, the tips of which will heat up to about... 50, 60 degrees centigrade when you pass a high frequency current down and that's what allows us to place the burns on the inside of the heart to perform the air fibrillation. These catheters have now actually got a little spring inside them at the tip. And together with the appropriate software, it allows us to actually record the amount of force that you're applying to the wall of the heart. And it actually comes up as a little number on the, on the, on the mapping screen. And the advantage of this is that it's made the procedure safer because you now know if you're applying too much force and you're likely to actually cause a cardiac perforation. You also know that every time you place a burn, you're actually in good contact with the heart. So you actually get much more effective ablation. Will it translate into better success rates? I mean, certainly at uh, both the Independent and at the St. Bartholomew's, we've been using this technology routinely now since January this year. We haven't really done enough cases, but my own feeling is that I think the procedure is going to be safer, quicker, and definitely more successful with this technology. And this is a, an image of a left atrium from a, a, an air fibrillation. Just to orientate you, uh, we're looking at the posterior wall of the left atrium here. This is the left common pulmonary vein. This patient only had one left-sided pulmonary veins. And this is the right lower, and that's the right upper pulmonary vein. And that thing at the front there is the left atrial appendage. Every single red dot that you can see here are the encircling ablation lesions that are placed around the mouths of the, the pulmonary veins to electrically isolate them from the rest of the left atrium. You can see also there's this pink color. And what, in fact, this pink color represents is a force map. It's a real-time force map. So every time you actually ablate and you come on with the, with the burn and you take one of these points, it'll look, put a color around it. And what the color actually tells you is that for each one of those points, there's at least 10 grams of force being applied to the wall of the heart. And I think you need a minimum of between 10 and 20 grams of force to get an effective burn. So you know, when I do these procedures, I set the color up so that every... What I want to see is a series of dots with pink rings going around the veins. And I know that enough force has been applied. And that translates into really quick electrical isolation. You can isolate a set of veins. I think in this particular patient, it took 20 minutes to electrically isolate the veins. You're looking at procedure time from start to finish of about two hours. You know, a couple of years ago when we were using the previous technology, it would take four hours. So it's a dramatic difference. It reduces the amount of x-ray exposure. And certainly, you know, if, if you've got a, re a registrar training with you who's on the catheters, you actually know exactly what they're doing because you can see the force that they're applying. It makes the procedure a lot more manageable and safer. The next thing are the, the balloon technologies. So we've got two types of major balloon technologies. The one that we're using at the moment is the cryo balloon. This essentially is a balloon through which you put nitrous oxide gas and it freezes the balloon down to minus 80 degrees centigrade or thereabouts. And that then allows you to, instead of burn a ring around the vein, it allows you to actually freeze the vein, which essentially has the same effect. So here you can see an X-ray image. Um, and it's actually quite similar to some of the images that AJ showed a moment ago with the, uh, um, the occlusion devices. Here, here we've got a sheath coming up from the leg, right atrium. There's no PFO or ASD here. There is a hole made in the interatrial septum by us called a transeptal puncture. The sheath is now sitting in the left atrium. Here is the balloon. You can see this pale circle here. So that's full of nitrous oxide gas. And that basically freezes the balloon down. Actually, if you do it under saline, you can see a big ice ball forming around the balloon. It's quite dramatic. 
And at the same time, we're injecting contrast into the left upper pulmonary vein. So you can actually see that the balloon has completely occluded the mouth of the vein because the contrast is held up in the vein. So you know you've got a proper occlusion and you freeze the mouth of the vein down to about minus 60 degrees centigrade. It's two four-minute freezes and it will electrically silence the veins. So if they're easy veins to do, that's, you know, eight minutes per vein, four veins, that's 32 minutes of freezing time. If you add on 20 minutes of getting vascular access, doing the transeptal puncture, uh, you're really looking at a procedure time of less than 90 minutes. And you don't need any fancy mapping system with pink colors and all the rest of it. You just do this with x-rays. And our preliminary data actually shows that the crowd balloon technology seems to be more effective, amazingly, than the traditional approach of using radiofrequency ablation. The success rates are much better. So, you know, if, if, if this takes off, then of course doing pulmonary vein isolation, which is the procedure that we do for practice lateral fibrillation ablation, becomes really very quick. You could argue you might even be able to do it as a day case procedure. And then finally, the final thing to point out is the outcome data for AF ablation. It's a big procedure still, uh, an expensive procedure. Does it actually make any difference to the patients? Well, these are the tangible facts that we have from all of the data available. AF ablation is definitely superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy for maintaining sinus rhythm. I think that's been demonstrated really quite definitively over the last five years. There are more trials ongoing, but just about every piece of work, research you look at shows that the, the outcome data is much, much better. To give you an idea of some numbers, two years after an AF ablation, more than 80% of patients will be maintaining sinus rhythm, as opposed to about 50 to 60% of people if they were on antiarrhythmic drug therapy. You go out to three years, easily less than 50% of people are maintaining sinus rhythm on a drug. You've still got about 70, 80% of people maintaining sinus rhythm with AF ablation. So it's definitely better. AF ablation also eliminates or significantly reduces AF-related symptoms in the vast majority of patients. That also, I think, has been clearly demonstrated. However, the holy grail is, does it actually make any prognostic difference? Notably, to the risk of stroke, because at the end of the day, that's one of the major consequences of having atrial fibrillation together with other comorbidities. Well, the non-randomized data shows that AF ablation probably does have a prognostic benefit. It does re significantly reduce the risk of stroke. And there are trials ongoing, international trials, to specifically look at that question. It will be some years before that data is forthcoming because, of course, you know, warfarin is very, very effective at reducing the risk of stroke and atrial fibrillation. But I think ultimately, within the next five years, we will know, we will be able to demonstrate that AF ablation does significantly reduce the risk of stroke, in which case that opens the doors to performing an AF ablation on people who've got asymptomatic atrial fibrillation but a significantly increased risk of stroke. Thank you.